Okay, let's dig in. Welcome back, everyone, from our little hiatus last week. So we are back in Genesis chapter 3, and we read through the first five verses. Let's just go ahead and read them again. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. All right. So we talked a little bit last week about what's not present in this story in Genesis chapter three. So items that are not present, the serpent's not actually referred to as the devil or Satan. That's a later uh, attribution to the serpent that it is a devil figure. We may notice that there's actually no talk of sin here necessarily. The idea that this is original sin or the first time that someone sins again will be read into the text later. And so I kind of very briefly presented the idea that what is happening in this part of the primeval history is an explanation for why the world is not perfect or what does it mean that both good and evil exist in the world and that as humans, we have moral agency or the ability to make moral decisions. And so creation has said the world is good. God's creation is good. The creation of humanity is very good. And yet we can look at the world around us and see that evil exists. Awful things happen. People commit atrocities. And so what does it mean that we have the capacity to decide, again, between good and evil. So before this scene, Adam and Eve, these first humans are almost infantile in their behavior. God feeds them. God directs them, tells them what they can do and what they can't do. It is as if they are children. And so this is kind of a coming of age story for humanity in terms of how it acquires its moral agency. So a few tidbits that are interesting from the Hebrew. So it does say in the Hebrew, good and evil, very literally. But we had talked in a previous week about how something like the sky above and the sky below or night and day, these sort of end caps are meant to encapsulate everything. So it's as if it is the tree of good and evil or the tree of the knowledge of everything from A to Z. So good and evil are kind of the end caps here. But this is acquiring of the knowledge of everything. There's a little bit of a word play here in the Hebrew for the word crafty, where the serpent is crafty, that is the word arum. And later um, in verses six and seven, which we're about to read, when Adam and Eve realize that they are naked, they realize that they are arumim, that they are, the snake is crafty and they are naked. So if we wanted to kind of rhyme those in English, we would say, you know, the snake was shrewd and Adam and Eve were nude. So they're intentionally trying to play on those two words together. And we'll talk about why or what that could mean in just a minute. So let's read a few more verses and then open it up to questions and comments. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree and I ate. 
Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent tricked me and I ate. We're about to get our punishments here. All right, so we're trying to deal with this concept of what does it mean that we have moral agency or moral decision making? And their eyes are open when they first eat. We touched on last week that the serpent here is the one who tells the truth. And so we're also kind of dealing with the fact that within this story, there's this kind of tension between what is truth and what is not truth. And so they aren't going to die right away. The idea of mortality comes into the story when we get to the punishment. So there will be death, there will be toil, there will be trouble. But after they eat it, they eat of it, they don't actually die. Instead, what happens is they become like God, knowing good and evil. We have this very comedic scene that we just read where God is strolling through the garden as if he is on his afternoon walk walking about the garden such that even Adam can hear him walking. And so he um, doesn't know, pretends to not know what's going on or what's happened here. And so God has to do an interrogation. Uh, where are you? Well, I'm, I'm here and I'm hiding because I'm naked. Well, how did you know you were naked? And then we get this series of blaming um, I think there's some really interesting lessons to be learned about this from this story of the development of human agency. So that wordplay I mentioned of Arum and Erumim, what's happening here is the introduction of fear. Adam hides and he says, I'm hiding because I was afraid and I was afraid because I was naked. The nakedness is a representation of the fear of humanity, and the shrewdness of the serpent is to play on that humanity. And we see so often that our moral errors come as a result of fear, fear of the other, fear of immigrants eating pets, fear of any other people group for which we commit genocide against whom we commit genocide. So this text is already saying that the craftiness and manipulation preys on people's fears. And we see that all of the time. There's also within the concept of moral agency, the idea of moral responsibility. And here there is an incapacity to accept responsibility for one's own choices. And so Adam is confronted and Adam blames Eve and Eve is confronted and Eve blames the serpent. I think because we know the history of this text of Adam blaming Eve, we imagine Adam in another part of the garden and Eve finds him and says, hey, here's some fruit. And he eats it not knowing what's going on. But we're told he was with her and he ate. Comments, questions? Yeah, Chris. There was a wonderful professor who studied at Pomona College some years ago. He said that he thought of you as the image of the ideal scholar teacher. That is, she acquired knowledge and you shared it. Ooh. Um, Interesting. Um, so Chris said there was a professor of religion at Pomona College some time ago who said of Eve that she was the ideal scholar teacher, that she acquires knowledge and then immediately shares that knowledge with either. Uh, that's a really cool framing. Um, this may not be a direction you want to go, but I'm, I'm struck. Um, I'm thinking about the opposite of that how it's evil coming right? And the word evil just shows up. Yeah, no, great question. So theodicy being what is the is the problem of evil? How do we get evil? How can evil exist if we have an all-powerful, all-beneficent God? Couldn't God 
prevent evil from entering the world. So where, what is the origin of evil is that question. And so Kevin's saying it doesn't really have a theodicy here because evil just sort of appears. It is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but how did evil ever enter the concept of this idyllic Eden? It doesn't have an answer here. It doesn't really say the source of evil. Um, and, and again, I think that points to the genre here being primeval history. Um, if we think of Adam and Eve in the garden and, and try to think about what were the origins of evil within that garden, how did original sin enter the world, etc., cetera, um, then we don't really have an answer here. When we change it and say, here are people existing in a world where evil has always existed, then this is their idea of how they came to understand that, e how they became aware of evil. Yeah, but there's not a real theodicy here. That's good. Well, reaching back to my Sunday school days, <clears throat> I, uh, I mean, I think that the way I, what I learned was that the evil was disobedience. So, and every form of evil is ultimately disobedience to God's will. Yeah, yeah. David says that thinking back to Sunday school, being taught the sin here is disobedience. And so any sort of idea of sin ties back to the idea of being disobedient to the will of God. Definitely. So that is part of the history of the interpretation of this passage, this idea that the sin is disobedience. Um, but then the question is, what is the punishment for that disobedience? It's not what God said would happen. And in fact, there is something good to come from having this knowledge of good and evil. They're not so infantile anymore. They're able to be full humans. Um, so I, I think it's absolutely right to connect this concept to the idea of disobedience. When we disobey the will of God, there are repercussions to that. Um, and now that we have moral agency because of the fall or because of this story, there are also repercussions to our actions. There's always a cause and effect. And that's what Adam and Eve are coming to understand. Yeah, surely. I just keep thinking, and you talk about it as coming of age, but I keep thinking of the idea that this, what the rules are, what is right and wrong, when you start, it comes from your parents, and then it comes later from society as well. And yet the truth is that, you know, as you, you get older, you go to college, you expand your worldview, and suddenly you know that all of the things you were taught are not exactly correct. Mm. And and so that from the knowledge of good and evil, it's like you have to figure that out. And I think that's what he's trying to do, is to you know, maybe figure out, so what exactly, you know, she's been presented with this other thing, where is this? Yeah. Oh, that's good, Shirley. So Shirley said that we grow up getting our sense of good and evil from our parents. And then we start learning societal expectations of what is right and what is wrong. And then as we grow older and our worldview expands, we come to understand that not everything we were taught is right. And we have to have our own ability to make sense of our moral decision making, what we think is right or wrong. And it seems like Eve is teasing that out here, trying to understand the extent to which she's able to make her own decisions and, and what are the right decisions. And Absolutely. That, that hiding thing. I mean, that's the reality. Some of us hide the right or wrong we understand from our parents or from part of society mm. because <clears throat> all it does is criticize them. Yeah, they've made a decision and they're hiding from that decision. And Shirley's saying even sometimes when we make a, the right decision, what we think is the right decision, but it is a decision contrary to what someone else thinks is right, we might hide that from them. Donna. I'm still uh, thinking that even as a child, that part obviously that people, there were only two people, right? At that time. Mm -hmm. um, and yet they were feeling that there were other on the Yeah, wow. Yeah. To make themselves a little bit higher. Yeah. Yeah. If they believe that God the whole time, why bother? Yeah. Yeah. 
it just shows you something to be rather, well, not hurt, but tougher. But less than what you hope for humanity. Yeah. Donna saying, wow, what a what a failure right away. How how human of them to immediately be confronted and then throw the one other person in the garden under the bus for their actions. And you were also saying, why lie to God if God is per is all knowing? Mm. Bob? I always find fascinating. Every quite Russian cell model has that. Mm. So when you look at the way people run, how we learn, I think it's what you say. Interesting. Yeah. It's not just two that run. I was saying every psychological model involves mistakes as part of the learning process. And that's what's happening here, that there's action, there's punishment, but the punishment's a vehicle towards development or learning. That's that's awesome. Yeah. I think also when you think of the world as we understand it in an evolutionary model, we don't know when was the first man or woman who actually had the ability to think this way. Mm. We assume that that's not exactly true of other animals. So at some point, this happened, and it must have been just as confusing and crazy. Wow, yeah. Uh, thinking about the development of the evolution of Homo sapiens, that if other animals do not have the capacity for moral reasoning, at some point in the evolutionary chart, there was someone who committed an act and thought I shouldn't have done that and how confusing and bewildering that moment would have been like this story portrays. Yeah. There's a lot of richness in this text. I think you'll agree. And I, I mean, I think before the fall, Adam and Eve are like children. I link that to the idea in the New Testament of, you know, that to enter the kingdom of God, you have to become again like a child. Mm. That's the, that's the ultimate message. Of yeah. The New Testament. Yeah, interesting. And on the flip side of that, when you were first think, talking, I was thinking of a verse by Paul where he says, you know, uh, now we know in part and later I'll know fully. And he talks about like right now, um, I kind of need to be guided like a child. Um, and at some point I'll know the fullness of the gospel. Um, and yet there's this message from Jesus. The kingdom belongs to a child that we have to be like a child. So, yeah, there's a lot of theological depth there, but um what is that interplay between being led by God like a child and having our own responsibility? Anything else? Yeah, Ben? I think there's, well, this, this is probably one of the most interpreted stories uh, in all of scripture. Um, and it's probably just interesting to go through and look at how different, you know, uh, Societies or theologians or have interpreted it, um, and then also non theologians also interpreted it. Um, so that's all interesting, but um, I think there's there's definitely an element of, of consciousness going on. The knowledge of religion is really something about humans having consciousness, right, or, or having a conscience and, and being able to discern the difference. I think there's also a, a, like an evolutionary <laughs> development angle that has to do with agriculture because mm. it's after they're cast out of the garden that they're having to earn their you know uh, their uh, their life their living from the soil of the ground <clears throat> um and stuff like that and um uh, you know that also ties into having a consciousness of not just of good and evil but things like the passage of time and the things you can plan to, to sow reap and all that stuff uh, which are markers of civilization, right? Um, and it 
comes back to kind of what David said about theologically, um, Jesus is saying, don't worry about tomorrow. Mm. You know, this, uh, the, uh, be like the bird that sows not. You know, he's, uh, before consciousness, before agriculture, people did have to have complete faith and trust in God to provide for them because that was, they had no other choice than that. That was just human nature. We can, you know, consider that the evolutionary model of going from hunter to cattle was to agriculture was to factor. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, so Ben talking about, and, and we'll read more of this as we look at the punishments for this disobedience, which is kind of the development of agriculture. What does it mean that humanity labors and works in order to acquire food? And so that's another origin question for humanity as it thinks like, why do we have to put so much labor, not if, if we were hunters and gatherers or if we were stationary and um, pursuing agriculture, all of it requires labor and sweat. And to imagine an Edenic paradise where everything was provided seems wonderful, but yet to survive, we have to work and labor. Not only that, but once you have fields, you have to protect them. So you have to have armies and have a concept of land ownership and mm. borders and nation states. Wow, wow. So Ben's saying after that comes protecting your land and armies and borders and nations. So responsibility. Yeah, go ahead, Toby. This is a very Western concept because this is just an extension of the very beginning of chapter one. Duality. I and they. Earth and sea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it says this is continuing duality different than like Eastern concepts of the universe or life, etc. This seems very Western, very oppositions. Yeah. So Tony observing that there are elements of this that seem very Western and Hebrew scripture will certainly influence Western developments of philosophy, which will then influence New Testament writings as well. So that's a great observation. All right. So responsibilities passed. Finally, to the serpent. And so the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will make your pangs in childbirth exceedingly great. In pain you shall bring forth children, yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to the man he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree about which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, thorn and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you are taken. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. We observed last week that this serpent, whatever kind of creature it is, isn't slithering on its stomach yet, because now the curse is that upon its belly it shall go. To the woman, there are is pain in childbirth, which is interesting because it's assuming childbirth already, but we haven't been told that there has been another human brought into the world. But now there is pain that goes with it. As an ex explanation of why there has to be pain to bring life into the world. Why does there have to be labor to get food? And there's so much pain associated with childbirth, it must be some sort of curse or punishment. That's the explanation. Questions or comments about God's edicts here? The last part to um, Adam, 
I, I guess I never thought about it because I haven't really lived in a culture where where the woman is too downgraded. But to think that he's being being cursed because he listened to the voice of his wife, that's such a strong mm. concept. And if you were to live in a culture like that, that really does tell you that women are not to be listened to very mm. strongly. Mm. Yeah, the patriarchy is strong in this passage. <laughs> he shall rule over you, and you're right, because you have listened to your wife. Yeah, yeah Kevin? Yeah, you and I talked about this too. It's such Robert stuff, but the patriarchy is far with the translation of that came in the Torah that was in Hebrew word that get translated to them, which has real implications for women's um, anxiety about childbirth and the whole mechanization of childbirth. Yeah, that's that's Yeah, yeah. Can you say that again? Yeah, when it says she'll bring forth children, mm-hmm. pain, and mm-hmm. then he'll torment. It's the, yep. the same word. Yep. Word. Yeah, here we go. Um, so the toil of birth and the toil of the ground being the same Hebrew word. And Kevin, tying that in to just this whole concept of the anxiety around childbirth, the labor of it, the medicalization of it. Anything you would add to that, Robin? <laughs> it was something that I read a long time ago yeah. when I was feminist about, and it was fighting the medicalization of childbirth. So um, I wondered whether it was true that it was the same Hebrew word. Yeah. Yeah, we talked about this over email, Kevin. Do you remember what we determined? Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to screen share for our online folks. This. Okay. All right, Ba'asev, okay. Yeah, it's the same word. It is indeed. Yeah. Wow, that's fascinating, huh? It's the same kind of work. Yeah. I think we also totally expect it because we get the just barely similar. And it's seriously, it puts so much labor onto the person. And this is what you've got to deal with for the rest No, by the way, you better go back and do it. If I started that way in any culture, I don't think I'd ever even sell the seed, whether I was in a female or a male. Yeah. 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 Don was saying it seems strange that they're just put in the garden and then this whole scene happens and there's all this punishment. Yeah. Not very fair. Why create the tree? Yeah. Chris was saying God is the one who has put this temptation um, as if to test them. I put this tree, I've told you not to eat it, and are you going to eat it or not? The temptation is there. You have one job. Don't eat. <laughs> You've got one job. One job. What were you saying, Toby? Because this is a fairy tale to explain after the fact yeah. the condition that we find ourselves yeah. in. Yeah. Um, I, I uh, yeah. Is, no, but you're right. You're right. But um, we can understand what the writers are wrestling with yeah as they develop these fables as they develop these mythologies what is it that they're wrestling with um let me read your that's a good concept this is already at the beginning an apologetics for a belief 
Yeah, it's an origin story for sure. Um, Jim says, redaction criticism would say that the redactor who put Genesis 1 and 2 together meant it as a point counterpoint. Genesis 1, God declared all was good and they were created in the image and likeness of God. Then in Genesis 2, evil is a potential, but not there until the eating of the fruit. And though in the image and likeness of God, now they, now they doubt they're like God and desire to be like God. Oh, that's interesting, Jim. Um, another part of the human condition. We're told we're made in the image of God, but to, to, to doubt that, to strive for it, to desire something different or more. Absolutely. Robin? Robin just why kind of yeah why was it bad to be naked um and it's just sort of like Robin's pointing out that there's just so many weird elements how how did they not know that they were naked kind of getting back to this state of innocence and a state of innocence nothing's wrong um the fact that they're naked there's nothing different about that to even realize um like the uh parable of asking the fish how's the water and the fish doesn't know that it's in water whatever that parable is um the state of innocence and what does it mean that we are no longer in a state of innocence yeah and it almost speaks to the idea that you are not animals you are humans humans are the ones that are wearing the clothes um you are unique yeah yeah you've got to grapple with that yeah and somehow, for some reason, the serpent can speak. <laughs> but there is humanity understanding that there is a difference between it and the rest of the species on the earth, and that it does have the ability to know that it's naked and to be ashamed of that, to be fearful of that. Um, and there's an attempt to do away with that shame, to do away with that fear. But it has to wrestle with it. All right, let's wind down this chapter. The man named his wife Eve. We talked about how Eve resembles the word for living or life because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made garments of skins for the man and for his wife and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, see, the humans have become like one of us, knowing good and evil, and now they might reach out their hands and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent them forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which they were taken. He drove out the humans, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a sword flaming and turned and turning to guard the way to the tree of life. All right, so we're answering another question here. It seems as if we're like God. We know good and evil. We can make our own decisions. We have our own autonomy. But what we don't have that God has is eternal life. We still die and return to the dust of the ground. We watch bodies decompose after death. And so there must have been also a tree of life and we were pushed out of that state of innocence out of that paradise before we could attain it there's reasons why the new testament will make a lot of parallels between jesus and adam because the new testament writers know this mythology they know this story you know of adam you know of the source of sin or the downfall, as it will be interpreted later. 
But just as through one man sin came into the world, through one man your sins are forgiven. Or just through this one man, no longer did you have access to the tree of life, but through Christ there will be life eternal. And so it is bringing it back to this concept of how is it that God lives forever, but we can't? Well, the answer to that is this story of the Christ. I think I've heard somewhere that that idea that, you know, we now have skins to clothe them is sort of a first hint of sacrifice. It's a sacrifice to do something for them to take the life of something mm. else. Mm. Um, Shirley saying that she read somewhere that this construction of a garment of skins is the first introduction to the concept of sacrifice, that an expiation of sins or the result of those sins is that something has to die or something has to be sacrificed or there's blood accountability here. Yeah. Interesting that God is the seamstress in constructing these clothes for them. And yeah, a curious question of where did the skins come from? Did something have to die? We could sort of um, for a tree to be through the cross. Oh, absolutely. Ben saying kind of bring there are there's so many parallels, so many parallels we talk about. Um, but saying that the cross gives us kind of a some tree imagery as well. All right, so Adam and Eve are expelled from the garden. Explorers will spend time looking through the signpost geographically of this passage, trying to locate and find the Garden of Eden, trying to find the flaming sword outside, guarding its borders. Any final questions or comments? Yeah, Rick? Uh, on 24, please. The he being a male pronoun for God. God drove out the humans. Yeah. Oh, interesting. The serpent's still hanging around. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and we kind of talked through the long list of possibilities here. Is it a royal we? Is it a um, later it'll be interpreted as a reference to the Trinity, but that doesn't come for a lot longer. Is it a reference to the divine council that was an ancient Near Eastern concept? Um, but yeah, the, the plural is used here. Oh, interesting. And the size of these things, but I want to know why they have so many. I think it was a kid that are they stitched together whatever. And I I think it's because they valued that tree as a symbol of something. Like maybe as a whole tree, but also as a Yeah. It's very important. Yeah. Yeah, well I'm not gonna say um, oh, I love that. So Don was just making a few references kind of to the concept of a fig being the fruit of the tree of life because um, you could plant a dry fig, you said, and a, a fig would grow out of it um, or that the inside of a fig looks like the proliferation of humanity. Um, that's the reason why the pomegranate will become a Christian symbol because there are so many seeds within a pomegranate. Um, and mustard seeds, yeah, absolutely. Um, and then Robin's saying, you know, you can't just put on a single fig leaf that will fall off. You've got to stitch it together.
Beautiful. Yeah, that's so beautiful. And that is going to be one of the major themes of the book of Genesis. So we're going to get covenant after covenant made with the people of Israel. And oftentimes those covenants are going to be one sided, that even if humanity doesn't keep up its end of the covenant, the unconditional love of God in this relationship will persist despite that. And here we have that in the very first interactions with humanity. Disobedience has come. Death was going to be the punishment. And yet God still cares for them. Um, God's, they're afraid. And God creates something to dispel what it is that they're afraid of. They're afraid of their nakedness and God will cover them up. Yeah, that's beautiful. Go ahead, Ben. You know, thinking about <clears throat> there may be there might be grains of truth, uh, scientific or moral truth in these uh, mythologies. And if the fig is the tree of is the fruit of the tree of life, then what is the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil? And I remember reading uh, uh, Terence McKenna has this stone ape theory of human uh, evolutionary biology that the fruit was uh, like psychedelic mushrooms or something, you know, uh, some kind of antigen. And uh, God's way of telling people not to eat it is because none of the animals are eating it. <laughs> uh, that's like the, the message they ate it, anyways. And that's sort of, you know, synesthesia and probably the earliest concept of language came from the psychedelic experiences. Fascinating. Um, so Ben was saying there's a lot of theories about what the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was. And he was um, referencing, this is an author, a philosopher? A... Yeah, well, he was kind of really popular. Kind of popular in this okay. Um, Terrence McKenna, um, who suggested that it was some sort of psychedelic um, mushroom or other fruit. Fascinating. Yeah, Shirley? And the cherubim with the flaming sword, and it's like this is the first reference of some sort of an angelic being, mm -hmm. and we get so many throughout the Old Testament, and maybe even into the New. But they're not exactly the friendly, warm, comforting beings. They're challenging. They're they're bringing terrifying news to people, mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and yet we turn them into these cute, sweet whatever protectors of us precious and moments how yeah. meant, is that even is that even at all biblical or is it just just something people we made up after yeah great question um there is so the question is you know we get some angelology here this reference to the cherubim and surely saying a lot of times in scripture there's um uh, some scariness to them and then we've developed this idea that angels are there to protect us and very sweet and compassionate. Um, yeah, there, there'll be so much more development of that later, post-biblical. Um, but we do get these references to cherubim, seraphim, but they are in very much these kind of very frightening scenes. They're described in ways in which they're clearly non-human, the seraphim with their you know multiple appendages and... Um, so, yeah, that'll be later development to kind of smooth the edges of the angel stories. Yeah. 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 Thanks for that, Robin. That's good. I was just going to say um, the God of the first few chapters of Genesis is not omniscient. He's like a he's like a sitcom dad. 
Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. 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 Um, so Kevin's saying there's an element of God being presented as a sitcom dad who's kind of bumbling through this story, completely unaware of what's happening, not only in his interactions with Adam, where he wants to know what's going on, um, but at the end, he's like, oh my gosh, if this keeps going at this rate, they're going to eat of the tree of life. Yeah, that's a very interesting observation um, that, yeah, this mythology doesn't have God as being omniscient because they've got to be able to make these mistakes. They've got to be able to come into it on their own. Yeah. Donna, last comment? Um, they, at that time, that was put together for this time and prior to the post. I know there was a hard time by the saying subsistence living these people knew what it was like to suffer and so they're going to want to understand why it is that they're suffering why it is that all of humanity is suffering yeah all right this was a great discussion today um next week we'll pick up with genesis chapter four we'll get cain and abel um we now have moral agency moral decision making and we use it by murdering our brother so that's <laughs> the result of that um let me just close us with a word of prayer God, we thank you as always for this opportunity to dig into scripture, um, to talk about these big, broad ideas. We recognize that we have the capacity to consider what is good and what is evil. We ask for your forgiveness for all those times we lean toward and actively choose evil, both in the things we consciously do and the things we don't realize we're doing. We pray for your continued guidance in this world that we might do away with our fears, do away with everything that it is to manipulate others and instead um, take responsibility for our actions. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, everyone. See you in worship. Bye online, folks.